Thank you, Greg. It's great to be back here at Rapid. It's nice to see you all. Thank you for coming. As I hope most of you know, this was the first workhorse of 3D printing. It really was the first machine that got to volume in the late 80s. It was one of the first machines that I learned how to use. Very exciting, SLA 250. By raise of hands, how many of you have ever used one of these machines? All right, good. I'm in good company then. It was a prototyping machine. All of the post-processing was done manually after the build, and there were virtually no standards at that time which related directly to additive manufacturing. We moved forward 30 years. We've made tremendous progress in terms of cost, reduction in size, availability, but the fundamental architecture of most 3D printers is still a standalone unit, often a box. In that context, I'd like to relate it to computing before the internet. Individual computers were very powerful, but in isolation, they really didn't achieve their full potential. And that is how I see the majority of 3D printing or additive manufacturing now. Each individual technology is normally siloed. They're great technologies individually, but they need interaction with each other, and especially automation with downstream and upstream processes. That's not too concerning though. If we look at the machine tool world, we look at what was originally separate machines, separate processes, and we look through the convergence cycle we see often in technology, and we see a multitasking machine. And just as a more specific example, I've borrowed some slides from Mazak, who have kindly offered a little bit of their development timeline, where you start with manual machines that are operated by operators, individual machines, and as you progress to the right-hand side, of that timeline, you get more and more automated and you combine more and more functions into a single machine. So it started off initially with lathes and then it moved on to more of a milling machine concept but that also incorporates some ability to turn. And the driver behind it was really to reduce time and to improve productivity, uptime. And if you have true activity-based accounting, the total cost of manufacture of these parts is much better. And that's really the driver behind multitasking. So bearing in mind that as a historical framework or context, we now have additive manufacturing, arguably one of the most exciting and advanced manufacturing methods we now have. Ironically then, many times parts come out of these machines only to be worked upon for hours by manual labor in order to finish them. So as we look at that post-processing step and often CNC machining is required, all of those three and look at the same convergence tendencies where does that take us? So that's why I'm here to talk to you about the reason why two heads are better than one in a hybrid additive manufacturing plus CNC machining context. A little quiz for you. What is a hybrid device which has two heads, one for adding and one subtracting, that all of you use or have used in your life? Turn to your neighbor, tell them a one word answer. What do you think? Awesome. Some of you. This is living proof that a hybrid device can exist with two heads and it is useful. Good. Background concepts. This talk is mostly about metal. It's a lot about machining. If you're totally an additive person, machining is where you take a billet of material, you remove chips from it using cutters, and you end up with what you want. It's a great process, by the way. Hopefully everybody here knows about 3D printing. This is a powder bed fusion context where you take a heat source, laser, arc, e-beam, something else. You often take feedstock powder material or wire or something else and fuse it into parts. If we were to look at metals, this circle is drawn with the largest proportion for powder bed fusion. When you look at three-dimensional parts, powder bed fusion represents the majority of the technology that's in use now. The second place, and depending on how you count it, it might be a third of the installations, are directed energy deposition. I hope you're familiar with powder bed fusion. I will talk briefly about it further along. Same with directed energy deposition, which is essentially 3D welding, right? Often on a robot, often inside an inert chamber. And I happen to be most familiar with laser cladding. There are other types of directed energy deposition, but that's a common example, is using a laser to melt powder as it enters a melt pool. So, background concepts done. This was an advertisement I got through my inbox a number of months ago. And I just wanted to point out that as an industry, if you look at the surfaces on that part, again, this is advertising additive manufacturing, look at the surfaces. You can see some of those surfaces have certainly been machined. The fact that CNC enables 
additive manufacturing, and particularly additive of metal parts, is often a story that's not emphasized enough, in my opinion. You look at both subtractive versus additive, they've got great strengths, they're complementary, in my view. Machining very agile, very productive, at least from a volumetric standpoint in removing material, and very accurate. Additive brings a lot more freedom to it and is far more efficient from a material utilization standpoint. So bearing in mind that virtually all metal parts require some kind of post-processing, often machining, not always, sometimes grinding, sometimes something else, some kind of polishing step. I just emphasize CNC enables additive. They are often used in tandem. Point, uh, point in case is a Siaki machine here, large vacuum chamber, electron beam, melting a wire. They do great big parts. They don't even try to get close to net shape. They intentionally overbuild, planning to machine the parts when they're done. Great example, good use case, additive and subtractive, used in tandem, albeit in separate machines. The driver behind it, accuracy and smooth surface finishes, at least topologically. So as we look at where we're at now in terms of the majority of use of powder bed and metals, out on the far right hand side I've got additive listed. Bearing in mind that's often powder bed context, you get great complexity, especially internal complexity. The productivity volumetrically compared to CNC is quite low. So over on the left hand side, CNC highly productive, highly mature, but you're limited in terms of the complexity, at least internally. Hybrid, we believe, fits somewhere in between those two and helps drive toward that upper right-hand corner where you can get cost-effective performance and especially the surface finish and accuracy that you need often for mating parts and can't get in another way. So as we look at this, trying to figure out where this will end up, our hypothesis, which we believe is now validated, is that for at least some applications, a hybrid machine combining additive and subtractive in the same machine provides advantages and will certainly become a mainstay in manufacturing techniques. The reason, of course, is you get a, more, a less wasteful machining process, still with the same accuracy, and you gain the flexibility, geometrical and material freedoms you get with additive. The potential of doing things in a single machine or the benefits, you have less capital equipment to buy. It takes up less space on your shop floor. You're only programming one system instead of two. Less work in progress, more repeatability, more automation. And maybe most importantly, you get access to the interior of these parts as they're made, whether that's to create the surface finish you want or for inspection or other types of activities. I think it might be most useful for you all to see an overview of what's happened largely based on machining platforms over the last 10 or 20 years. And bearing in mind a lot of you may not follow machining, this is specifically hoping to be helpful to you. I've divided this timeline above the line is directed energy deposition, below the line is powder bed fusion. There have been fewer players in powder bed fusion, so I'd like to start with that. I hope you're familiar with powder bed fusion. You spread the powder out and the powder is already sitting in place before you use an energy source to melt it. Some of the earliest work was done in the late 90s in Japan on this, combining C and C in process with powder bed fusion. Fast forward to just before 2012, where we really saw the emergence of a commercial product with Matsura's Lumex machine. This is a video of it working, and as you watch it move, you see it spreads the powder, it fuses, the layers, melts those layers, and then intermittently it will come in and machine those layers as you go so that by the time you're finished you pull a part out of that machine which does have a machine surface finish on it. So arguably a, a complete part, a net shape part. They released it in North America. They announced that just at the very end of 2013, early 2014. I was fortunate to be on their stand recently and they allowed me to take some photos. Internal complexity is really the strength of this process. You can see I'm holding in, you know, in one of the hands, certainly internal complexity that's not easily achievable by machining, looks you know, very reminiscent of powder fusion, but with smooth surfaces. So last November, Sodok announced and showed a machine that's very, very similar to that. Same concept, powder bed fusion with integrated milling. So that covers this in terms of powder bed fusion machines integrated with CNC machining. If I come back and revisit directed energy deposition, 
Again, this is a process where the material is deposited at the same time or in parallel to your heat source. It's a form of automated welding, essentially. Reviewing back through history, this is not a new idea. Lots of people have tried this over the last 20 years, and some of you are probably here in this room, and I'm thinking of people like uh, Radu Kovacevic or Frank Liu or even Ryan Wicker or others. In the research world, the Fraunhofer's have certainly done work on that as well. As we reviewed it going back seven or eight years, we came to the conclusion the reason it hadn't caught on commercially may partly have been for market size, but really it's about practicality. And we said, what we really want to be able to do is switch between adding and removing metal the same way you change between cutting tools. And being in the academic world at that time, we wrote an academic research bid and started an academic project where we had a group of all these fine people, including uh, Renishaw, TWI, Delcam, etc. And after about four years, we showed this machine, which was a retrofit machine, an old machine. We managed to cram inside of it. You can see down here a supply unit and the world's first tool changeable laser cladding head. This is a quick video of it happening in action. So we just put away a touch probe. We worked on this in collaboration with Cummins. So in the rotary axis, you can see a Cummins impeller out of one of their diesel engines. And then that head needs to be supplied laser energy, shield gas, and feedstock powder. So this little supply unit drops down and docks with it. Once you're docked up, then you can start the flow of argon or whatever inert gas you're using, start the powder flowing, switch on the laser, and you're able then to deposit metal. As far as we're aware, this is the first time in history where we had true push-button interoperability between adding and subtracting. And it was a very exciting moment for all of us to be able to really switch between those two very easily. You can see that we worked on a variety of parts, aerospace blades, as well as impellers and other things. Repair was one of the early markets we targeted because they're already accustomed to doing an additive and a subtractive step, albeit normally often in a manual context. So you might be manually welding material back on and then manually finishing it. So having proved this method, we then tried it out in a variety of machines. And in 2013 at EMO, which is Europe's largest machine tool exhibition, with about 2,000 exhibitors, we launched this as a commercial product with Hamel, who builds specialist machine tools for making large uh, steam turbine blades. So you can see that machine is quite sizable. We did deliver milling, probing, and cladding all on a single machine. They are literally stored in the tool changer. This is not just a made up idea. They really do live in the tool changer. And it was billed as the world's first hybrid machine, certainly with directed energy deposition, acknowledging the Lumex powder bed fusion as a, another hybrid, but not of this kind. So this is a quick video of it in action. You see normal milling. As soon as you're ready to switch over, then you put that milling cutter away out of the tool changer comes a head for deposition, laser deposition. Again, that head needs to be supplied with laser, shield gas, and feedstock material. And so we connect up a supply unit here and it docks. And as soon as it's docked, then you start the flow of inert gas, switch on the powder, switch on the laser, and you're able then to deposit metal. And on this particular demo, they wanted to go all the way through the automation steps of blend machining after you were done, and then even on to polishing. So we went all the way through, including an inspection cycle with probing. So we were grateful to receive an award at EMO for that. We then move on, and at the end of 2013, DMG released their machine. So their laser tech machine did a beautiful job of marketing it. And this is a video of it in action. They used one of the Fraunhofer deposition heads. And you can see they grew apart mostly from scratch, starting from a very small starting billet. And I believe the deposition time on this was around six or seven hours. You'll have to check their website to be exact. And once they had deposited, then they selectively machined certain areas. It was certainly a moment where the machining world stopped and said for the first time in a widespread way, this is added manufacturing, not in a dedicated machine that we don't really recognize. This isn't a mainstream five axis machine. And it really, I think, has helped them, or helped them awaken to the idea of this is now possible for mainstream CNC machines. 
So that then moves us on to Rapid last year, where we released our uh, commercial version of the Ambit system. It is a retrofitable system. We were grateful to receive the Alvin Award last year for it. Probably one of the reasons why we received that award is because we had already fit this to a variety of machine tools. So we've done a variety of controllers, a variety of machine configurations, and the intention is to make it generally applicable to most machine tools. And that becomes very exciting where you can incrementally improve your existing capital assets in order to leverage them for additive. So just to give you a time context here, that was 2014. We now move into the end of last year. Mazak then released, we were honored to, to join with them to help produce the Integrex i400AM product. It incorporated multiple deposition heads. So looking carefully at those nozzles, you can see they're, they are distinctly different. They are for different types of features, different jobs. This is one of the demo parts that they did, reminiscent of an oil and gas type application. You can go through their video where they show a variety of different processing. And I'm actually going to switch forward to this one if that's okay. So this shows the high rate head, essentially surface cladding over a relatively large area. And the type of deposition and the nature of the beam profile that you would want is set up specifically for that large area, but it may not be the optimal head for other types of activities. And so by being able to switch between multiple heads, now you can see deposition in the upper left-hand corner of a boss in much finer detail. You've then got on the bottom right a large flange coming down at high rates, laser marking in the middle, and you saw flood coolant being used while machining. These heads are removed from the build, you know, from the working area of that machine, so you can use flood coolant whenever else you'd like. So really the first time that we're aware of where additive manufacturing has had the ability to switch between multiple heads in an automated way and really change both the laser, the powder focus, and the other parameters that have historically been impractical to change regularly throughout a job. The deposition there was ink and L. That's about a half inch wide flange, so a substantial amount of ink and L onto a stainless steel shaft. I'm going to take a little aside for a moment and talk about the ability of, of scaling. Additive manufacturing for a long time in planar layers has been sort of held hostage by this. I need to deposit my material. I'm doing that in layers. The result is a stair-stepped effect on that surface. And so it's a little bit hard to scale. As you try to increase productivity, your surface finish gets worse. So you're in this dilemma of, I'm going to have something that's sort of halfway in between what I need. Last year, I showed this picture on the right showing the ability to switch between multiple spots and multiple laser profiles. And people say, yeah, but you know, optical energy is really easy to reshape. You could probably do that with one head. And that may be true. So is it really necessary to switch heads? And my answer to that is, while this is ideal and can easily be done with multiple heads and may also be done with a more sophisticated single head, what else are you going to put on these heads? And as we stop and look at the particular nozzle configurations, that's a lot harder to change on the fly mid-job. So my take on it is that one head is not, does not fit all when it comes to different jobs. And as we look at these head, different heads and say, okay, essentially we're using a tool holder as an automation solution now. So what else do you want to put on it? My answer is a whole range of things. Because we're developing that microstructure as we go, historically in machining, you already know the microstructure because it's set in the billet when you buy it. So now we want to be able to assess not only the outside surface, but even maybe the subsurface of what's being deposited. And we've seen some great talks here already about internal subsurface inspection and other things, and I believe we will see a range of tools implemented. And if you're in a gantry machine, great, you've got a long length, you can put those tools along. But as the number of tools and the types of tools becomes more diverse, you run out of space. So I believe the ability to change between multiple heads is essential for certain types of processing. And that's really the crux of where our IP lies, is in that multiple head change. Now, resuming back our historical discussion, at Euromold in 2014, so the end of last year, Cyberman also released a hybrid product. This is a wire-fed laser cladding unit. The MFG meeting in March 
we were fortunate to be awarded a, a recent prize, and I apologize if you've seen this picture too much around the stand, around the exhibition. Uh, just last month, WFL also announced that they have a hybrid machine, and not only do they have a hybrid machine, they're using a 10 kilowatt laser, which sends a, a new benchmark for power inside of the machine. What you do with all the heat that's generated there is yet to be fully disclosed and seen, but uh, Optimec are also rounding out the final uh, developments and finishing touches on their America Makes Award, also trying to create a retrofitable solution for their lens systems. So that gives you the context in terms of directed energy deposition. For completeness, I'll give you just a couple others. Permaline has a very large machine going back to development starting in 2007. It's a, what I would call cold spray. It's not really cold, but it's forcing metal particles at a substrate at high velocity. They compact and they have quite uh, high deposition rates. Also, Fabrisonic have always done hybrid processing. They are a sheet lamination process, so they use an ultrasonic welding head to solid state join different lamina of metals, and then they machine to their final size. And last but not least, Herco has also announced their intention to do something in this space. So that leads on to a whole raft of applications, which is an entire talk in and of itself. But let's just pause for a minute. Really the message for you today is, what does all this mean? And my assessment is, by my count, there are now more, or at least the same number of hybrid machine producers as there are powder bed fusion producers in AM. And by the end of this year, when we see the large machine tool shows, I believe there will be a significant margin of the number of hybrid producers exceeding powder bed fusion machines. Years ago, I had to write something on the bottom of our letterhead. I decided to write, the time for CNC to be a spectator to the developments of additive is past. And I believe what we are seeing now is the fulfillment of what at that time was an aspirational statement. We do indeed see that this convergence cycle that has typified machine tools can also be seen in additive. It creates hybrid devices which we believe are useful. And no longer do you need to look at things and say, oh, this is an additive part, this is a CNC part. You can actually drop that down now to a feature by feature level and say, this feature makes sense to be additively made. This makes sense to be made by CNC machining. So it's more of a slider. You get to choose whatever you want. It's digitally driven. You can change on the fly. You choose what's best for those features on that part. Thank you very much for your time today. It was a pleasure to be with you. Yeah, we have time for a few questions if anybody has any questions for Jason. Here. Sorry. What, what do you see as the, the biggest technical challenges that these hybrid systems face? Partially it's conceptual. When we started this, the, the mindset of machine tool people is to get heat completely out of a machine tool. That's why you have coolant and other things. So it's taken a while for the machine tool industry to think, okay, I'll allow a heat source into my machine. And I think the management of that heat is crucial to make this effective. So what we've seen so far in applications is where you add a relatively small amount of metal to an existing part, it's easy. As you increase the proportion of metal deposited, it becomes more complicated. Others? Others? I think the business case is really what's driving this forward, Terry. And so the complexity that we're accustomed to in powder bed machines, I don't know that we'll see that level of complexity in hybrid machines, maybe in the future, but I think it sits somewhere in the middle. And as long as the application is well chosen, even just the automation aspects of being able to finish in process, I think will drive it forward. So it, but inherent in each of these processes are all of the same issues in additive. You gotta you know, you got manage powder well. You need to worry about making sure you got extraction, safety, all of these sorts of issues extend into a machine tool as well. Oh, so I have two questions. The question in front was, what about polymers? Um, we have 
seen a few people show different polymer ideas. Uh, we have a little bit in development ourselves, but there's nothing for sale as far as I know. Herco's probably been the most forthright in saying this is what we intend to do. What, one last question. Okay, in the back. This is the very issue I was addressing with Terry's comment, which is where you have a large heat input, especially with these higher power lasers, and you're depositing lots of metal, there is certainly residual stress in how do you handle that. And our short answer is on applications where you're doing dimensional restoration or cladding, where it's a relatively small amount of material relative to the part you're adding onto, it's not an issue or not a very big issue. As you then grow parts from scratch, if it's thin-walled and symmetrical, you can do it. When it deviates from thin-walled and symmetrical, it becomes more complicated. And I think we're really seeing right now the need for additional analysis of what that distortion will be prior to building in software that's under development in a variety of places, but no longer, or no, not available yet. All right, I know there uh, might be a few other questions. Jason, you'll be uh, I'm around. hanging around. So uh, by all means, head Jason up. Thank you very much. That was a great, uh, great discussion. Thank you.